This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the NX Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Ships channel and on the X, KUNX Talk Radio and Affiliates, Talk Stream Live, and Paranormal Radio. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red tic tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality that we live on a mysterious planet in a mysterious universe. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. For those listening on KUNX Talk Radio and Affiliates, I have several other shows each week that only air on my YouTube channel. Thursdays is Mysteries with the History at 2.30 p.m. PST with my co-host, Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio. And on Fridays at 3 p.m. PST is Weekly Strange News. This Friday, we'll be with my guest co-host, John Russell, where we look at all the unusual news and strange headlines from around the world. So definitely check out my website at strangeparadigms.com for all show archives, more information, and direct video links to my channel. My guest today is Kelly Chase. Kelly is the host of the UFO Rabbit Hole podcast. In her real life, she's also a branding and marketing expert. Her work is centered on the role of storytelling as a catalyst for change and expanding human awareness. She is passionate about leveraging her skills and expertise to support the UFO disclosure movement and all of those engaged in the important work of driving forward our understanding of who we are as a species and where we fit in the great cosmic order of things. Let's bring in our guest. Miss Kelly Chase. Kelly, welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. How are you? I'm great. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. I am so excited. I loved talking with you on your show. And now that you have some pretty big news, I'm like, she's got to come on over and tell us everything about her and her research, everything involving UFOs. So let's kind of get into that a little bit, asking you probably the biggest question of the evening, the afternoon, whatever time people are watching or listening to this, how did you get into the topic of UFOs? You know, through a back door, I think like so many people do. Um, I'm actually very relatively new to the topic. It was um, the spring of 2021, where I had I was kind of in pandemic fatigue, like I think everyone was, my family was going to go get a beach house together at the Outer Banks. And I had actually seen a UFO one time when I was a kid at the Outer Banks. And so this sort of had been top of mind for me since we were going back there. And I had so suddenly sort of started tuning into the news stories that obviously been going on for a few years, but I hadn't been as maybe aware of them. And so um, I kind of got it in my head that I was going to go on this vacation and I was going to entertain myself for the week by getting to the bottom of the whole UFO phenomena. And I don't think it will surprise anyone listening to hear that I did not get to the bottom of it in a week. Um, but it did kind of trigger this incredible um, journey that I've been on now. I just I discovered that there was sort of an endless rabbit hole of information in different ways, you know, that you can take all of this. And, um, you know, I'm a naturally inquisitive and curious person. And I think I was just like absolutely hooked. And so it just sort of built from there and became the podcast and now a book. 
So you actually just started your podcast about a year ago, and it's called the UFO Rabbit Hole Podcast. Tell us a little bit about it and the goals or intentions of it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what's interesting, I, I come at this whole thing from a slightly different perspective than maybe some other people, because my background is really in marketing, and I'm a brand director for an e-commerce company, and you know I've worked for lots of different agencies over the years, and you know, the focus of my work has really been around messaging and, you know, go to launch strategy, that sort of thing. So how, so something I think about all the time is like, how do you introduce new ideas to people in a way that's going to break through the noise and, and have them actually pay attention? And so in some ways, once I got into UFOs, what I, it might be a case of when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, as they say. But to me, what this really looked like we were having here was sort of a messaging problem. You know, once I dove into the UFO phenomenon and realized how much was actually there and how much has happened and how much information we do have puzzling though it may be, you know, I really started to think why aren't more people into this? And it and I started realizing, you know, it's just it's a messaging problem. It's hard to it's hard for somebody who has no familiarity with the topic to just jump in. It's like where do you even start? That's how I felt at the beginning. I didn't even know, you know, where to begin. And so my goal with the UFO rabbit hole was really to create sort of an on-ramp podcast to this whole phenomenon, something that was going to be, you know, grounded enough for skeptics, that was going to be accessible for people who were new to the topic so they could just start on episode one without having to know anything and feel like they're, you know, getting up to speed, um, but also deeply researched enough so that people who have been following this for a long time would still find a little nugget or something in there that they hadn't, ex that they hadn't come across before. So really, it's just been about creating this very structured, science-based on-ramp to the phenomenon for people who may not be as familiar with it. And it's been a really, really cool adventure and a cool journey to see more and more people you know, coming to this topic. And I, I know that's something that you and I are both very passionate about. And it's been so neat to see people just sort of waking up to it over the last couple of years. It's very interesting that the the approach that you're taking, or I guess the lens that you're using to look into this topic, and that's through a branding and marketing kind of mentality. Because we need to understand that when you are a marketer, or when we look at people that do marketing, or even marketing itself there's a lot of psychology that's involved that's that's like probably one of the foundations of it branding and marketing so how has that helped you with the ufo topic if at all that's such a great question you know actually as i continue down this hole that i this rabbit hole um there's more and more overlap between the work that i did in my marketing life and and this so something that i'm always been really interested in is the hero's journey. Um, my dad was a psychiatrist and I kind of grew up with Joseph Campbell and you know Carl Jung and all of these different ideas. So the hero's journey was something that was always really interesting to me. And what I found is that really good marketers understand the hero's journey and use it in their um, use it in their marketing all the time because it's just in some ways you can think of the hero's journey almost as like a piece of technology that kind of operates on the software of consciousness and so you know there's certain kinds of story that spur us to certain kinds of action and so everything from that's really informed everything about how i've approached the podcast like just as an example you know when um when I would teach my teams about how to use the hero's journey in marketing, you would always, the, one of the main things you always say is that like, okay, so if we're talking about the hero, the, the customer's hero's journey, they are Luke Skywalker. You know, a brand often wants to make themselves the hero of the story, but you're not the hero of the story. The customer is the hero of the story. You as the brand should be uh, Yoda. You should be the one who is helping the, the customer achieve a goal. Right. And so, you know, that's sort of just one of the many ways that I've tried to take on this approach with my podcast is that, you know, I go really in depth, I present a lot of options, but it's really my goal to never um, force my views on someone or lead people to any particular conclusion. My goal is really just to lay out the path and have the faith that people are going to walk that path and that their own natural curiosity and that their own you know, call to adventure is eventually going to take over and that they're going to go from there. And so, you know, I really, everything about how I craft the podcast really kind of comes through, through that lens and with that awareness. And I think it just makes it 
um, a little easier for people who are new to the topic because they don't feel like they're um, they're necessarily being asked to like believe anything in particular, even necessarily in in UFOs. So I think that that's been been helpful to me in kind of reaching a new audience. With that sense of humility, I think that'll help people grow better and stronger than bringing their ego with them saying, oh, I know everything. Listen to me because I have all of the answers. We've seen those people come and fall very quickly. And those that have all the answers or claim that they have all the answers are straight up lying to you. Because with this phenomenon, and that even goes with the paranormal and everything mysterious, it is a mystery. Meaning nobody knows everything. <laughs> That's the point. And while it can be incredibly frustrating, like for yourself where you first got in, you're like, I'm going to solve the UFO phenomenon. It's going to be super easy uh, <laughs> because you, you see it on a surface level and it, it doesn't seem complicated. But as you begin to dig and dig and dig, and as your show goes, jumping into the rabbit hole, you're like, wait a minute, you're scratching your head and you're like, this is incredibly complex there's so many moving parts there's so many different aspects as well to it and you're like you need to know all of this and that takes decades of research if not your entire life i feel like i'm only just at the very beginning of this journey and i don't have answers i'm in a period of expansion and i'm not sure at what point that period of expansion ends and you start to prune it back. Um, you know, but I, I, I'm not in a big hurry to get there. If I ever get there, I, I really believe in not taking anything off of the table until you have a strong reason to do so. And so if that means that we have, you know, a thousand different options for what could possibly be going on here, then that's, then that's where we're at right now. And I think that that's, I think that's okay. I was in New York this last weekend for an event and, um, Whitley Stryber was speaking there and he, shared this quote from his wife that I thought was really beautiful and touching, which was basically that we as a species are very young. And so we shouldn't even be trying to have answers that what we need are better questions. And I really, that really, I felt like spoke to kind of the heart of, of what you and I are both sort of referring to here. You are so correct. And so is Whitley. It's about asking the right, the correct questions because anyone can an can ask anything. That's so easy. And depending on how that question is asked, the receiver is going to say, that's X, Y, Z. But then if you go into a more detailed question or a unique one, it makes the receiver stop, pause, and they're like, now that you mention it, when you put it like that, let me elaborate on my answer. And so questions are very important, but asking the right questions is where it's at. And I think for this topic, sometimes that can be incredibly difficult. What are the right questions? Because those that have been looking into this field for decades, for some, some aspects of it, they're kind of asking the same questions. And then, but people that are coming into this field brand new with fresh eyes, because they have a new perspective to it, some of them are able to ask new, fresh questions, even ones that are relevant to today, right? Just like yourself. You just got into this in 2021. That is amazing. And you've come so far and you've touched on so many things because on your website, you made mention that for each podcast that you do, it easily takes about 40 to 80 hours worth of research. Why, in your opinion, does it take that long? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. It's, um, it's definitely been an adventure. I've been glad that I've done that though. You know, I think it's been necessary. I think particularly it's just, you know, that amount of work is also just like me kind of being honest and humble with myself coming into this, which is that like, you know, I'm a pretty smart cookie, but I also just got here, you know? And so, uh, I definitely want to make sure that when I am saying, when I'm speaking on this subject, that I'm having respect for all the people who have come before me by making sure that I'm doing my due diligence, that I'm familiar with the work that's already be, being done and that I'm able to speak about it appropriately. And I think that just being able to do that is a huge undertaking. Like the idea that I would then put my own opinions out there at this point feels a little uh, not the point, you know? <laughs> I do 100%. Uh, I've only been in this field for about two years, so so not much longer than yourself. But I remember, like, even to the t to today, I don't really like sharing my opinion just like yourself because 
one, I think that maybe we don't feel necessarily authorized to that we're still so new that our opinions are changing every single day with the new information that we come across. But secondly, it's when we bring in our opinions and our bias, sometimes people might shove that information down the audience's throat and then those opinions don't really have a foundation. They don't have any value except, oh, I think this because I think this. And you're like, okay, but why? I'm not really sure why, but it just, it's just that answer. And so with that, again, with that sense of humility and just providing the information, but also multiple paths or multiple, I wouldn't say conclusions, but possibilities, right? It allows the the listeners, the viewers, the audience to come up with their own conclusions because for everyone, this this is their own journey. There, there is no one straight path. You can take the historical path. You can take the scientific path, like the Galileo Project. You can take the more consciousness, spiritual path, or you can bring them all together and make your own. And I think for every single person and for the just huge amounts of people that I've spoken to, they all have their own very specific path. And same with you. You're looking at this through a marketing branding lens from the background knowledge that you have. And that's fascinating. And I've never heard of anyone else talk about it like that. But it's when we bring our previous experiences that we're able to understand our current environment. I totally agree. Absolutely. So in your book, The UFO Rabbit Hole, book one, implying that there that there are more to come. Mm-hmm. You look into the aspect that what if humans are, or what if UFOs are us from the future? And this topic has really caught people's attention. What did you find while researching that possibility? You know, that is such, it's such an interesting hypothesis. And I think that it's the one that I have had, that I have changed my mind the most on and will probably continue to change my mind about. Um, I think that I started as thinking that it was, did not seem very feasible to me and then moved to thinking that maybe it was feasible. And now I'm, I'm in this kind of like gray area. I don't know. I think what's really interesting about the time travel issue. And I think that you could actually say this probably about the interdimensional hypothesis as well, is that if just as a thought experiment, if humans at any point in the future crack time travel, then we can expect that they almost are certainly visiting us now. And so that is a weird, that's a weird little issue with it, right? Because I mean, I guess a lot of it comes back to, do you think time travel is possible? And the truth is that we don't, that we don't actually know. And something I actually like to point out to people because someone pointed out to me and it absolutely blew my mind is that we, there's actually one form of time travel that we do know is possible. Um, through the theory of relativity, basically, you know, it's like the movie Interstellar, any other, you know, sci-fi movie where, you know, there's a time dilation issue where people are either moving very quickly or maybe they're slingshotting around a black hole that's got a very intense gravitational pull, but either going very fast or being really close to a massive object, either one of those things could cause that person to experience only like maybe seconds or minutes pass, whereas days or months or years may have passed back on earth. And so, time dilation is actually one form of time travel that we know works. The thing is, is that if that's the, in the one case that we know, you can only go forward in time, which would mean if that's the only kind of time travel that's possible, that these people might actually not be visiting us from the future, but from the past. So that adds a whole other strange layer into it that, that make, you know, that I don't totally know what to do with. Um, but I do find it very interesting. I find it interesting that people like Ross Colthart, who obviously just has like a sterling reputation and seems to have some very well-placed um, uh, sources within the intelligence community, um, you know, he's he's said multiple times that he has heard that this is future human. Um, you know, he also puts out there that he doesn't know for sure. He doesn't know whether he believes that or not, that it could be misinformation, that could, he could be being told the wrong thing on purpose. Um, that maybe the person who's talking to him has been told the wrong thing on purpose. So, I mean, he's not saying it's definitely future human, but he is saying that he has sources within the government that he believes, believes that this is future human. And so, you know, that leaves us in a very, in a very strange place. I think the main question then just becomes if it is us from the future, from the past or from wherever, 
why is this our approach? Like, why is it that like for 80 plus years, we've, we've had these odd experiences and sightings and all like, why wouldn't they just tell us what's going on? Like, why wouldn't they just communicate with us? And so, you know, that, that creates a whole other world of questions as well. So I do find it to be a really interesting, interesting hypothesis. And I, like I said, I think I change my mind on it just about every day. With that new information that you come across, it's only appropriate to change your mind every single time you look at the topic. Because I've been asked this question a few times, and I'm just not knowledgeable in that aspect yet. So when I saw that, that it was mentioned in your book, I'm like, I have to ask Kelly because I, I want answers. <laughs> I want to know what's going on. Because for some, it could be classified as a totally outlandish possibility. And then you have others stating, well, it's kind of what I'm interested in right now, because that sounds really cool. But for you, why do you think this, this topic in particular with UFOs potentially being humans from the future, why do some people find it so enticing more than maybe it being just extraterrestrial in origin? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I So Michael P. Masters, uh, the author who's kind of a, you know, at the forefront of this particular topic, and he's written a couple of books on it. You know, a main argument that he makes, which I think is a pretty strong one, actually, is that um, we know humans exist. And we are pretty sure that time travel, at least in some sort of capacity, is probably possible or will be in the future. And so in turn, so there is just sort of a simplicity to to this idea. You don't have to come up with a whole new civilization or a whole new species or, or anything, you know, or some, like, we don't have to come up with a lot of things that we're not aware of to make it happen, you know? So in some ways, it's sort of like a, an Occam's razor type argument where it's just saying, you know, based on what we already know exists, this would be the most likely explanation. And I, um, I will say that I caution people against using Occam's razor in the realm of the unknown. I think that it's still a good tool and that it can be great for um, thought experiments and for, you know, trying to whittle down the information a little bit. But I think that, you know, the idea of Occam's razor is that like the simplest explanation is the is probably the best. And so you just try to get down to like, what is that most simple explanation that would fulfill all the requirements. But I think it's just really difficult for us with really truly unknown experiences and phenomena for us to even say what's like the most likely or what's the most simple scenario because i just don't think that it's just so clear that we're not working with all of the evidence like we're not working with all the data that we would need to really make that pronouncement so like i said i think occam's razor is very compelling i think it can be helpful but in this in this arena i wouldn't jump to any conclusions based on sort of an occam's razor type argument and why not? I mean, I think that, like I said, I think it's just hard to know if it's if the explanation that you're giving is the simplest explanation. Like just as a thought experiment, let's say it's not future human. Let's say it's ultra terrestrial. Like let's say it's some sort of like breakaway ancient civilization that existed since Atlantis or something wild like that, right? Then suddenly the idea that it's future humans actually isn't the most simple explanation because you have this other population of humans that are already here on the planet that we know have like a 10,000 plus year jump of technology on us. Like, so it that's just one, I mean, that's a, an out there example, but it's an example of how new information could be introduced that would necessarily mean that the future human hypothesis is not the most simple hypothesis, which would completely change the outcome of the whole like Occam's razor approach. Interesting. When you put it like that, you're like, oh, okay, that makes more sense because it's, it's all about perspective. Right. That's really what it's all about. And that's changing from person to person. So you just touched on breakaway civilizations. This is another question that a lot of people ask because it's very enticing thinking, oh, what if? So Let's hear your thoughts on that. I mean, it's one that at the beginning I had a hard time grappling with, but, um, you know, I am very interested in the theories about the potential for there having been pre ice age human civilizations on earth, at least existing in some pockets. Um, I do think that there are, that there's some significant, I mean, there is some significant archaeological evidence for the fact that there were these pockets of super advanced 
um, civilization coming out of the last ice age. And so that makes you wonder, like, if, since the world was such a mess for like a thousand years before that, you know, could these be remnants of something that came before? And I think that a lot of people make the jump then immediately to sort of a whole ancient alien scenario, which, you know what, once again, let's not rule it out. Like I, like I said, we should leave things on the table, but I don't know that that's necessarily the only explanation. I think that, you know, the further back in the past we begin to push the advent of human civilization, then admittedly, yes, you do have to start considering perhaps the idea that human civilization was seeded in some way, just because it doesn't make sense that there would be these different pockets of like high civilization right around at the same time when most humans were living as hunter gatherers. Like we just know that that's a fact. So, but at the same time, I don't think that's a, a jump that we should automatically make. But I do think that, you know, sites like Gobekli Tepe, um, that show us that right at the begin, right at the end of the last ice age, there were civilizations who were capable of megalithic constructions, who had an awareness of descriptive um, geometry and advanced astronomy, um, you know, and potentially even written language. That's a little bit more controversial, but seeing that those things were around at the end of the last ice age, it does make you wonder if maybe those were the remnants of something that came before. And if that was the remnants of something that came before, could those people, could there have been a pocket of people that held on to and retained that knowledge from before the last ice age? And if that's the case, they could be then hypothetically thousands of years ahead of us in terms of their um, technological development and understanding. And so you know, it feels like such a wild out there hypothesis. But when you start to like really look at the facts and, and really be like, OK, so if it's this wild, I should be able to rule it out. Right. But the more you dig into the facts, you're like, you know, it's this seems like it could have been possible. Did it actually happen? I don't know. But I like once again, I the more I look at it, I don't find what I'm not finding is reasons to rule it out. And so I think that's what's really exciting about it. So Beckley Tepe is a fantastic example of something like this. So I really appreciate you bringing that on to our dinner table. Kelly, we are coming towards a break. Hang tight. We'll be right back. gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db vx this is micah hanks of the micah hanks program right here on kunx and right now you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only christina gomez source for alternative talk radio on the internet vx howdy folks this is lou elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend christina gomez on shifting the paradigm do you have an interest in the paranormal then you'll love the unxnetwork.com 
The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, Ghost, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on The X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network. And you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm. paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez, Gomez on, on the X. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Welcome back. With me today is Kelly Chase. There have been a handful of celebrities lately that have come out and told their UFO encounters, but they're the celebrity that kind of started it before it was cool. And I'm talking about lead singer of Blink-182, Tom DeLonge. You've done some extensive research on him and his influence on the conversation. What can you tell us about your findings? I mean... I think that the Tom DeLonge story is, it's its weird to me because I feel like as a community, we're kind of moving away from that story. People aren't, are sometimes a little more hesitant to bring up Tom DeLonge. Um, but I think that that whole entire story is utterly fascinating for a few reasons. One is just that it is the craziest story I've ever heard. Um, and the second is just that in the midst of all this story, what you have is really extraordinary evidence that is almost impossible to really impeach that tells us that Tom DeLonge in 2016 and 2017, when he was going on Joe Rogan and he was going on Coast to Coast and he was saying some of just like the wildest things I've ever heard anyone say about the UFO phenomenon that we, and he was claiming to have these really high, high level, well-placed advisors within the military intelligence apparatus that were, you know, guiding and instructing his work. Um, what you find is that we actually have proof that that happened and that he, it seems impossible that he was telling the truth, but he, we know for a fact that he was at least telling the truth about who his advisors were within the government and that these were the exact people within the government who, if there is secret UFO knowledge to be had, these are the people who would have had it. And so, you know, I always caution people. I don't think that that means that therefore everything that Tom DeLong has said must be true. Um, 
I, I think that he probably, you can kind of tell just the way his mind works and moves and in interviews that he's, he's very well read on this subject and that he's able to make a lot of different connections between different things that other people might not necessarily see. And I think that that can be very valuable, but it's hard to know. It's impossible to know what of kind of the wild things he's saying are the direct result of like really solid intelligence that he's gotten from the inside and what is um, maybe him extrapolating something or assuming something or making a connection that he doesn't necessarily have the confirmation on. That's extremely hard to do. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also really important to note that despite the fact that he said some really crazy things and he said since, go back and listen to those interviews. I got in a lot of trouble for that stuff, but I'm not allowed to say it anymore. And I do recommend that people go back and listen to it because it's pretty crazy. Because then what hasn't happened since then is that you haven't seen, um, you know, Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, Steve Justice, like you haven't seen any of these, you know, early members of TTSA. Yes, TTSA kind of disbanded and has, you know, moved on to other things in a lot of ways. But those original founding members were willing to go on stage with him. They were willing to attach their name to his. And since they have left TTSA, they haven't said anything negative about him. Nobody, you know what I mean? Like they very easily could have disavowed him or distanced themselves from him, particularly after they left the organization. And they haven't done that. And so I think that people need to take another look at what Tom DeLong has said. Like I said, you don't need to, you probably shouldn't believe every single part of it as being like the gospel truth. But um it's a very remarkable perspective to take in and to understand that at least some of what he's saying is informed by the people who would know. So for to the Stars Academy, TTSA, let me re-ask that question. I said too many T's. <laughs> for to the Stars Academy, TTSA, why do you think it flourished and then flopped? That's such a good question. And I think the answer really comes down Honestly, a lot of it comes down to Tom DeLonge. I mean, a lot of it was what was going on. And I mean that in the best way, to be clear. So first of all, I don't think that what's so crazy to me about this whole story is that what becomes clear immediately when you dive into the Tom DeLonge story is that none of this would have happened without him. Um, I think that there were people in the government who were, and I think that there have probably always been people in the government who would have made a push for disclosure if they saw a way to do it that made sense that seemed like it might actually work and that you know because they were also taking they would also be taking a huge risk um to their careers which is why it's so important that this you know whistleblower legislation um is being pushed right now so that you know we can get protections for people who would come forward and so you know, I think that the, there was that willingness there, but until you had somebody who was willing to just go knock on doors and ask the hard questions and bring these people together and to give them a vision for how they might actually convey this to the public, you know, he had a, he had a platform, he had a, you know, something of a little media empire himself. And so, you know, the, they wouldn't have necessarily had access to a platform like that without him. So I think that he just provided the opportunity and that these people, you know, quite heroically really answered the call, even though it was Tom DeLong, the guy from Blink-182. I mean, they took a real gamble on that. And so I think that he was really the key for why that flourished. And I, you know, and in some ways, and I mean, like I said, I mean this with all respect, I think he's the reason it fell apart a little bit too. And it's only because he approached the whole thing with this just absolutely insane level of ambition. I mean, who takes it upon themselves as a private citizen to be like, we're going to get the UFOs. <laughs> we're going to get the government to admit, admit that UFOs are real. Oh, and also we're going to build one. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's just a wild uh, thought. It's a wild thing to think. It's a wild thing to even try. And I think that there's a way sometimes in which Tom DeLong doesn't totally connect with reality and that that level of just like belief in yourself can actually kind of make powerful things happen in your life when you're not, you know, he never blocks his own shot. He just goes for it. But at the same time, I think it put him in a position where it was now, it's now easy for people to say, you know, Hey man, like you said, you were going to build a UFO. Where's that UFO? You know? And so it's, I think a lot of people will couch, what he has accomplished or not accomplished with TTSA is some kind of a failure, but I just don't think that that's a like fair or accurate assessment of what, 
he actually accomplished. And I think that you almost have to look at those even larger goals as honestly something to admire, because if it wasn't for his fearlessness and belief that he could make this happen, none of it would have happened. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big Tom DeLong apologist in that way. It's when you have those big ambitions or a vision or a goal that makes you, I guess, for some kind of um, scary or a threat. Because for the most part, a lot of people, they have small goals. They have they have little things that they want to do. But something like Tom, where he's going out into the public, which he's already been a celebrity for quite some time, but he goes out, he attempts to create TTSA, collecting some incredibly high-profile people, going out stating, it's going to happen. We're going to do this because I say so. People like that are are rare and it's unfortunate to say but it's true so yes he didn't accomplish everything that he wanted to but he did start the movement and now we're having celebrity after celebrity talking about their own encounters miley cyrus demi lovato this new one and her name is escaping me she was on jimmy fallon telling about her encounter and what's her name i'm not sure i think i missed that one. <laughs> oh well she's it's fine I, like it's, <laughs> it's on the tip of my tongue but if I say it wrong, someone's going to say, like, you got her name wrong. So I do apologize. I am not hip with the times when it comes to celebrities. So I want to very profusely apologize for that. But what are your thoughts on this? Celebrities are coming out, people that have ginormous audiences stating, I had an experience. I think it's phenomenal. And I'm so excited to see it happening. And I think that, you know, I have seen just even in my own life, the ability, I think, you know, I was hesitant to kind of like come out of the closet about all of this stuff and to, you know, it, just be very open about the podcast and about what I'm working on with, you know, my family and my friends and my work. Like, what is my, what is my job going to think when they find out I'm, you know, not Kelly, the branding expert, I'm Kelly UFO girl. And they didn't know. And I, you know, I think that it can be scary for people just knowing the stigma around the topic and the things that people can, you know, unfortunately think and say about you. Um, and so I think it's so incredibly powerful to see um, celebrities and people with a platform being willing to come forward and share those stories, because I've also just found on a much more micro scale in my own life, my willingness to come forward and say, you know, hey, I think UFOs might be real. And I had an experience myself that I can't explain. Um, has opened up other people to tell to tell me their own personal stories as well. And so I think that what's been really unfortunate about the stigmatization about the of this issue is that it's left people feeling who have had experiences can be left feeling really isolated and alone because you have this thing that's happened to you that you can't really talk about and you don't really know how to explain it. And it doesn't, it just doesn't fit into your life. But at the same time, for many people, these experiences are extremely profound and they're life changing in one way or another. And they, they spark, you know, kind of lifelong searches and questions inside of people. And so to have to kind of forcibly amputate that part of, of yourself and of just your human experience, I think is really damaging. And I think it probably does a lot of damage within our, our culture and, and within our just trust of ourselves and each other. And so I think it's absolutely incredible to see people who are willing to step forward and kind of take on that stigma and say, yeah, it happened to me too, because we're just creating more space for other people to share their, their stories. And I think that, um, you know, that's a really beautiful thing. And with people that have these big audiences, they're able to be so influential getting uh, what we now call trends, right? Getting things to become trendy. Now, when it was with Camila Cabello, I looked her up because I was like, I am going to know this woman's name because I watched her interview. What was kind of interesting about her encounter in particular that also took me a little bit aback actually was when she said, when I had this sighting of a UFO, I felt like I was chosen to see it, to record it, and to share it with the mm. uh, with the public. And that can go one of two ways. That can either sound incredibly egoic, like, oh, this girl, like, what is she saying? That she's the chosen one? Or you can look at it from a different perspective. When I had Japanese researcher Norio Hayakawa on the show, 
he said that from his research, he found that a good amount of people, if not everyone that has an experience, are pre-selected to do so. Mm. What do you think about something like that? That is such a good question. I think it's complicated. I do think, like you said, I think that there's some comp. I I think you have to be a little bit wary of feeling like this happened to me in particular because there because I I have there was a reason, right? Which it, you just need to be careful. I don't think you need to totally reject the thought. Like if I'm being totally honest with you, I there I have had experiences and I have this sense that like the work that I'm doing right now with the UFO phenomenon is the work that I'm supposed to be doing. Like the, the, this is my little corner of my little work that I'm going to do. And that it's important that I'm, that I'm doing it. Right. And I don't think that there's anything, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I do think that there are, you know, as I study more about um, the hero's journey and about initiatory experiences and that sort of thing. I mean, I think a lot of people who have anomalous experiences, um, it's not uncommon to have that that sense of like meaning and mission that come that come out of that. And I think that that can be really, really positive. You just also have to pair that with a certain amount of um, self-awareness and critical thinking. Like you can't drink your own Kool-Aid too much. You know what I mean? There's a difference between feeling like you had a meaningful experience that you were supposed to have that 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 steered you in a particular direction and like drinking your own Kool-Aid and believing you're some kind of a messiah. Like there's there's a lot of gray area in between there. And I think you just have to like try to stay on the healthy on the the healthier side of that. But I do think that it is real that people have that and that having anomalous experiences and UFO sightings and that sort of thing can help people get in touch with sort of like a deeper meaning and purpose for their lives. It certainly has done that. It certainly has done that for me. You're absolutely right. I think that people that have experiences and that um, that for the most part, if they're positive, right, it changes their perspective on life. I guess even if they're negative as well, it still changes the way that they view the world. And you can also be in the field and not have an experience. And I feel like those types of uh, instances are really heartbreaking. They research for years and years and years, and they never have an encounter, uh, which is is a kind of, I guess, in a sense, ironic. Are they not pre-selected <laughs> to have an encounter and only put in the research? Because we do need to keep in mind that when you have a personal experience one it's personal two there are usually necessarily facts always involved it's because you're looking at it through your own perspective lens so you're bringing in your opinion and your bias and that can affect how you conduct the rest of your research which we've seen the time and time again not in this field but just as as a general statement so i think that when we are dealing with people that have their own experiences celebrities or those that have conducted infinite amount of research they're all very important in in this mural that we're creating with all of these puzzle pieces we have to include every single aspect of this topic to make not just the perfect mural but the truth the correct one and the term of truth or the term of even disclosure changes from person to person so for you what does disclosure mean? What does truth mean to you in this field? Mm, that's a really good one. So I'll start with disclosure. Um, I I think disclosure in many ways has happened. Um, the government has said that UFOs are real. They've said that we don't know what they are. Um, there's a lot of other kind of like obfuscating and, you know, twisting of words and, you know, backpedaling that's been done also. But that that Pandora's box has been opened. They've said it and they haven't really rolled it back. So that's where that's where we're at. And so in some ways, I think the disclosure has happened. I think that what's frustrating for those of us in the field and who, you know, anyone who fo who follows this topic at all is that it's like we've been waiting for a disclosure and it was such a like ah, life changing moment for us. And then like the rest of the world just kept moving and didn't really like barely hesitated, barely stopped in their steps to, and was like, oh, okay, I just kept moving. And so I think that that's kind of disorienting. And I think that what people now are looking for is in from disclosure is just that more meaningful disclosure. They want to know 
what the government knows and they want kind of like in more uncertain terms for the government that this is what's actually happened. I think what people are really waiting for is that sort of smoking gun from the government, the admission that the public is not going to be able to ignore. And um, I am hopeful that that is coming. I, I continue to remain hopeful. I think that it goes more slowly than people think. I think that the pushback that we're seeing um, within the government and, you know, even just everything surrounding this delayed UFO report is evidence that there is pushback, that they are struggling. That, but you know what? We've seen huge strides being made in the last five years. And so I have faith at this point that hopefully at some point in the future, we're going to get that level of disclosure. But I also think that it's important for people to not be overly reliant upon that and to understand that the government doesn't own the phenomenon and the government doesn't own our interaction with the phenomenon. Um, they own a lot of data and information that we maybe not don't have access to, but our ability to study the phenomenon and to learn about the phenomenon and even to potentially interact with the phenomenon is not something that the government has control over. And so I think that the more that we can do to help eliminate the stigma, open up conversations, do what we can to fund the, you know, private uh, and, you know, uh, enterprises like the non-government scientific groups and people and investigators who are doing this work and trying to get out in the open, you know, I think that that's where we need to focus our, our abilities. There's There are people who are the right people doing this work within the government right now, trying to turn things around. I hope they'll be successful. Um, but if not, you know, the work continues here on the ground for the rest of us. And so I think that um, it's important to kind of not be too overly reliant on the government to kind of like tell us what the truth is, you know, which kind of leads to the second part of your question, which is what is the truth? And I think the truth is extremely hard to um, land upon at times, especially with kind of unknown phenomena and phenomena that can be so subjective. I don't know. I, I don't know what the the ultimate truth is. And I I'll, I'll be honest, I think that I suspect that a lot of the reason that the government is so reluctant to be more forthcoming for th this information is not necessarily that they're hiding some big like, you know, something specific, like it's aliens or it's Atlanteans or it's I, I think there's a real chance that that they don't know that maybe they have a lot more information than we have but that they don't necessarily know what it is that we're dealing with. And I think that that would be a really embarrassing government, a really embarrassing admission for the government. And so sometimes I do wonder if that might be part of the holdup. When we're talking about embarrassment, we are aware that when it comes to the government, any government across the globe, you need to have this sense of power and control. And when you lose that one, it slips through your fingers. It, it, it makes your foundation wobbly. It makes the people begin to question. And that can be dangerous in itself. So I think that with this uh, topic and uh, and getting this delayed UAP report, which I am wholeheartedly disappointed, even though many people assume we're not going to get information just like the preliminary report we got in June of 2021. I still want to get one. They promised us one. I want it. I, okay. I, I don't care. <laughs> Because because at the same time, we're also we're demanding something. The public is demanding something and the government has to comply. And because they're supposed to serve the people. Right. That was that was written when the United States was created. So I think that I'm disappointed in the fact that we haven't received it. I am waiting for the moment that we do. But we were supposed to get it in October. Here we are in December. We already heard rumors that by December we're supposed to get um UFO witness hearings in Congress. At this point, I I hope that's the case, but with the momentum that we have, it doesn't seem like that will happen. Maybe we'll yeah. get that in 2023. So let's touch on that. For you and um, UFO witnesses coming to Congress, do you think that's a big step or do you think that we're actually not going to be seeing that anytime soon? I'm very hopeful. Um, when I was in New York this past weekend and was lucky enough to hear Christopher Mellon speak, um, he spoke to this directly to the to the report, everything that he like could share. And, and also, you know, looking at kind of the road ahead and, and a big thing for him that he talked about was this whistleblower legislation that they're working on getting passed. 
it is extremely robust. Um, he was explaining it. I won't try to remember all the various points and everything that, that was involved because I'm sure that I will misspeak and not say it correctly. But um, I was surprised at all of the fail safes and, and things that they had built into this. It seems like it's really robust legislation that would actually, I, I think some people were afraid that like, yes, they passed this legislation, but that it wouldn't be really sufficient to actually protect people who were stepping forward. And I think that for the people who do want to step forward and be whistleblowers, I mean, if you've got family and all of that, I mean, you want real assurances that this risk that you're taking is not going to result in like the destruction of your career, some sort of weird retaliation or, you know, that sort of thing. And you, you can't blame people for that. So my hope though, is that if they can get this, as long as they can get this legislation passed, I'm very hopeful that it's going to create that sort of uh, protection that people feel comfortable enough um, stepping forward. And at the point that people start to step forward, I mean, you have to almost assume it's a big assumption, but I don't think it's a crazy one that it's going to kind of be a, a, a domino effect and that more and more people as they see that like, hey, you actually can step forward and it's not going to ruin your career, that more and more people are going to be willing to come forward with the information that they have. Because I think that, you know, yes, there are mustache twisting villains that exist in the world. But for the most part, I think that most people see the significance of this information for the human race. And I have a lot of faith that people are going to want to step forward and share share that information with their fellow citizens. There still is that threat factor at this point in time that if people talk out, there will be consequences involved. And so that can be a little nerve wracking. But then you have our community where everyone's talking out there like I had an experience. Oh, me too. Oh, I've been doing this research for a long time or I was a part of the military or the government at some point in time. And I'm here to tell my story, which is really fantastic. So you touched on a little bit earlier that it could be well, at, it could be that we're not going to receive what we define as disclosure from the government, but we are already doing that amongst ourselves in this community. And this community is only growing every single day. More and more people are getting involved because more and more people have questions and they don't know where to look because now that the preliminary report was uh, has been released right the media was covering it months in advance they were so excited the report drops they stop covering it so they yeah. opened the media opened so many people's minds to this conversation and so many of those people those fresh new minds came over to our community and they're beginning to watch these shows podcasts reading books watching documentaries asking questions because they want the answers because, in the, and this is my opinion here, I think this is the most important conversation that humanity is having at this point in time, because this, this information will only lead to our future in a positive way, because we are a spacefaring species. We are supposed to be traveling into space, and we can't do that necessarily if we don't have an understanding of other species out there. I completely agree. Very well said. So then while we're touching on that, there's a lot of people that are uh, not really interested in the field or haven't had an own ex their own experience. And they state, oh, well, why would they why would they come down here? We're so insignificant, if anything. Right. But what do you think about that statement? Do you think there's some truth to that? Or do you think that there is that we would be a really good tourist attraction for extraterrestrials? <laughs> That's a great question. I think, so I mean, I think Earth in and of itself is um, significant. I mean, you, we are this beautiful blue oasis in the middle of just a lot of nothingness. It's it's crappy in every direction from here for really, for as far as we know, right? So um, we are this little oasis and there's just the road there, you know, we're still trying to figure out for sure whether or not there may not, whether or not there may be other life in the solar system. But from what, what we can tell, even if there is that kind of life, it's probably like microbial or, you know, that sort of thing. It's not, it's not like what we, we don't look at the other planets and see what we have here on earth with these like rich and diverse biospheres and these, this huge abundance of different kinds of life. Um, I think that it's, we, we should remember that really, you know, how special what we have here is. And I think that it would be silly to say that, that another species wouldn't be interested, 
um, because it's clear that we have something very, very special here. And I also think that humans are special. You know, we're, we live in an age where cynicism is very uh, in fashion. You know, I think it's really easy to be a critic and it's really easy to say, well, humans are trash and we don't deserve, you know, who, who would want to talk to us? We're just stupid, you know? But at the same time, like, look at what humans are able to accomplish. Even just the fact that we went to the moon, that's crazy, you know? And I, um, you look at our, our art and our culture and the things that we are able to create and conceive of and science and literature. And I just, I, we really have to watch out for kind of that like fashionable disease of cynicism because it causes you to look at the world in a way that's just frankly not accurate where you're only seeing the bad because I really think that if you can't look at humans and see what like might be interesting about us like you just need to look again I think that we're we are flawed we have um a lot a lot to learn and a lot of ways that we can improve as a species but to say that humans aren't significant or just not amazing in general I think is um I think it's honestly just inaccurate I think that there's a you can refute that easily we've got nothing to data Kelly, we are coming towards a break. We'll be right back after this. gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB VX This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm Thank all of you for listening to The X. But did you know you can watch live streaming video and catch your favorite video casts on the UnX Network YouTube channel? Wow, you mean I can watch The X shows anytime? That's right. Watch any show anytime, even binge watch your favorite programs. Which shows are on the UnX Network YouTube channel? You can watch Most Haunted with Dan Terry, Entity Voices, Paranormal Evidence, Paranormally Blonde, and Unexplained Phenomena Australia Australia, and many more. Also, be sure and catch live coverage of special events and special broadcasts from the UnX Network. That's great. I'm going to subscribe to the UnX Network channel right now. Awesome. You can find everything you need to know about the YouTube channel at unxnetwork.com. That's unxnetwork.com. It's your one-stop shop for everything unexplained. It's the new mainstream. It's the UnX Network. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about 
the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534. Or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. Getting involved in the UFO field, they hear the term the five observables. For those that don't know what they are, can you explain them? Yes, absolutely. Let me hope I don't forget any, right? Um, so there is instantaneous acceleration. So basically something that can just start going to an extreme speed very quickly, like we saw this in the Nimitz incident where um, you know, they saw this object moving like 80,000 feet or something like that in less than a second. Like, so that's what we mean by instantaneous acceleration. Um, there's also transmedium travel. So the ability to move through um, air, uh, water, the vacuum of space, and potentially even through solid objects, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, you know, but we see that specifically with um, USOs. So, you know, submerged objects. Uh, they just shouldn't be able to move as fast as they do underwater. That's crazy. And so, you know, the ability to transition from those different mediums, I think is really, really interesting. Um, what are the other five observables? I'm going to blank on them now. There is def um, There is lack of propulsion. So no sort of um, visible propulsion like we would see from like a plane or a rocket, you know, these sort of traditional um propulsion systems that we would use, we don't see any evidence of these things whatsoever. And um, we also don't see any uh, traditional flight surfaces. So um, planes or wings or I mean, planes, wings or any of these things that you would normally see on, on a flying object that we would understand in the sky, it doesn't seem appear to um, have any of those. And it also the other one is um, hypersonic speed without signatures. So we are able to, to make something move faster than the speed of sound, but there's a sonic boom. And it's like, you know, it's, it's a, a jarring experience for us to make something move that quickly. And yet these things seem to be able to move faster than the speed of sound without having any of those signatures. There's no sonic boom. There's no real evidence that that kind of like speed barrier has been broken that we would see with like a more traditional um, propulsion. So all of those things together kind of comprise the, the five observables. And these are important things to consider when people have their own experiences or when we look at people's experiences as well, their encounters. Um, one thing that you touched on were USOs. And there's this really interesting potential theory that one reason to why these craft don't make a splash into the water when they enter is because they seem to have some type of force field or some type of vacuum around them. Have you heard of that theory? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. They, they're definitely working with some sort of a technology, like a paradigm that we're not familiar with. Um, and, and these things, that 
you know, with the with the submersible objects and, you know, even stories of them like going into the side of mountains or something like that um, suggests that they aren't that they aren't so much using some kind of a traditional propulsion like we would think about it, but that rather that these craft have the some sort of ability to um, manipulate space and time in a way that we don't totally totally understand. And so I find that to be really interesting because it 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 suggests that there's a whole other technological paradigm that exists out there that we haven't really gotten a handle on yet as humans. Um, but hey, hopefully maybe we can someday because it sounds, you know, something like that could have a real potential to help us solve some of our, you know, climate issues and that sort of thing. So I, I think it's a really interesting thing to study. Shifting gears just a little bit, how can storytelling as a technology affect human consciousness from your understanding? Well, I'm actually writing a book about this that I hope will be out next year. It's going to be quite the undertaking. So it might be, this might be 2024, I'm trying to get it out by next year. Um, and I, I think what's important for people to understand is that I think that people are designed to have these kinds of anomalous experiences. It seems to be something that most people, not everyone has them, but most people seem to have at least like the capacity to have them. And, you know, we see when we talk about anomalous experiences, it's not just UFOs. It can be some, it could be like some sort of a religious experience, or it could even be something um, kind of more like a really profound synchronicity or something that basically what it, it when somebody has an experience that hints to them that there's more to their reality than they knew or that they had suspected, it kind of creates this, this initiatory experience. It begins this search and this quest that often, you know, very much aligns to the hero's journey. And so, you know, the fact that this particular kind of story and experience can infect people in a, in, in a particular way, in a sort of a consistent way, it makes you think that potentially that this could be, um, some kind of a technology. And I think it's really important for people to understand that for a few reasons. The first is just that I think it's important to understand that these things can happen and that when you have sort of an anomalous experience um, and you just shut yourself off to that and you say, that's not possible or that didn't happen, that I think that you're also shutting yourself off to one of the more profound experiences that a human can have, which is this sort of thing that happens once you recognize that the world isn't quite what you thought in this quest, in this journey that brings you to a new understanding of yourself in the world. And so, you know, I think that's part of the reason people should understand that and maybe be a little bit more open to it. So um, I think that, you know, I joke often that marketing is uh, psychology for sociopaths. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be moving into this part of my career where I'm using marketing in a different way. And I want people to understand what, how these stories and these storytelling technologies are being leveraged against them in all of the media that they consume every day. And a lot of it is, you know, relatively innocuous, trying to get you to buy, you know, a certain kind of something, you know, <laughs> like trying to get you to buy a product. Um, but it's also used against us, I think, in a lot of other ways. And so it, and it's really easy to kind of hijack someone's thinking and perception with these certain kinds of stories. And so I think it's really important for people. I, I want to write a whole book about it to help people understand how that happens and how you can sort of push back against it and really live your own story as opposed to consuming stories that are kind of fed to you by the media. Stories are empowering, and they also, as you mentioned, they influence so much. When we deal with stories every single day, every day, through the media, through books, through conversations, people are always telling stories, how it be about them or about somebody else. And it's through those stories that people are able to not only share their experiences, but also their morals, their ethics, and how they perceive the world. So what I kind of want to touch a little bit more on is how storytelling is um, different or even potentially the same as with technology and oral traditions. Because we usually when we hear of storytelling, we think of it being oral, right? Mm -hmm. Where one person tells it to another, but you're looking at it through a technology aspect. Can you kind of go into detail on why that is? Yeah, so I think so it's a couple things. One is that I'm very interested in the kind of consciousness 
angle to the UFO phenomenon. I know a lot of people end up there once they start once they start going down this rabbit hole. And I, you know, I won't get too weeded there, but I do find that to be really interesting. And I'm really interested in these different um, theories of reality and of consciousness that are being put forward by people like Donald Hoffman, who wrote The Case Against Reality, who are basically coming out with this theory that says, that's postulating that um, space-time is not the fundamental unit of reality and that there's something deeper than that. And that you know, basically the argument is that consciousness is fundamental to reality and that all of our reality and matter, everything that we experience and interact with actually springs forth from consciousness. And it seems like um, as crazy as that idea sounds, it would fix a lot of things that have been broken about um, physics and our understanding of reality kind of since the advent of quantum mechanics. This would begin to heal that division and gives us a hint at what a kind of unifying theory of everything might look like. So we don't know for sure, but it seems more and more likely that consciousness is fundamental and foundational to reality. And so when you understand that, um, then suddenly understanding storytelling as a technology is, is a way not just to influence people, but in some ways to um, influence reality. You know, I think about my book now that I have written it. It's my book in some ways is its own little entity. It is out in the world and people are experiencing it and absorbing it and having their own experience of that work that has nothing to do with me and of which I am not a part. And so in some ways, like my my book almost takes on a life of its own then and it's out in the world having conversations with people that I will never meet and, you know, perhaps changing the way they think, perhaps not, but, you know, at least having that interaction in a way that I wouldn't be able to. And so stories move this way through our technology um, and through our media, and it, and it creates the boundaries of our reality. It creates what we are willing to entertain could be true um, and what we're not willing to entertain. And so in a lot of ways, it creates what it, it creates our perception of what this life is. Um, but that perception of what life is, isn't necessarily like correlating to what actually is. And so I think it's really interesting to, and important to understand how storytelling impacts people, how it can be used against you, how it can be used to confuse you, how it can be used to turn you against people, but also how when you have a clarity of understanding of your own story and your own role in your own story, that you can use those stories to learn and to develop and to grow and to evolve as a human being. And I think that, you know, that that kind of that's what I'm the most passionate about more than anything is not getting people to believe in UFOs or not to believe in UFOs, but ultimately to get people to believe in themselves and to believe in their own journey and to engage actively in the work and the joy of living. Because I think that so much of our current culture has us in this state where we're consuming stories um, instead of living our own story. And I think that's a great way to control people. And I'd love to see us break out of that. That was so well said. What are some of your favorite thought experiments regarding UFOs? Oh, that's a good one. Well, like I said, I do think with the future human one that that's a fun, you know, or, or also with interdimensional travel. If you think about the fact that like, if in any dimension, it is possible to travel interdimensionally, then interdimensional travel is happening, um, almost certainly, just by the sheer number of, of dimensions that there are and someone's doing, if it's possible, someone's doing it. And so I think that's a fun one. Um, and then also, you know, people, I, I love to come back to an oldie but a goodie, but the the Fermi paradox, I think that's a great one. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I think a really good entry point for, for people who are newer to the topic also to kind of start to understand. So the Fermi paradox for anyone who's not interested, I think probably a lot of people are, is just the idea that like, okay, so there's so many different um, galaxies and solar systems and planets in this universe that there almost certainly has to, like that if there is life out there that like, it's, like where is it? There should be 
conceivably probably a lot of it, but like, where are they and why haven't we ever encountered them? And so, you know, the Fermi paradox gives you a way to kind of a portal into this where you can start to think through all the different reasons for why it, it might be that we haven't, that we haven't found them, you know, everything from they aren't there to maybe we're just in some weird outpost, we're far away from other civilizations. And so they just, we don't see them very often or, you know, it, even something more kind of deep and trippy, which is just the idea of like, does a, if an ant colony is next to a highway, like does the ant colony have any awareness of that, of that highway? And so could we be kind of like the ant colony? Could there be um, life all around us that we're just not aware of because it just doesn't track for us within our concept of what that looks like? Like, could we have the equivalent of a super highway <laughs> right next to us that we, we just don't, see because it's not we're not like tuned into that frequency so I think that's a fun one too I do love me a good thought experiment I find them so interesting and especially when you uh look into these as well because what you're doing is you're thinking outside of the box that we're in today's age not really taught to do anymore uh, when it comes to school, when it comes to media, here's the information, here's what you're supposed to know. All right, move on. And a really uh, interesting example of this is my mom is from Venezuela. She moved here in the late 90s. And when I was going through school, she's like, why are all of the answers A, B, C, or D? Back when I was in school in my country, you weren't even given those options. It was, what is the answer? write a paragraph. And it goes to show that, and this is still happening in that country and, and many others, it's really just in the States and a, and a few other countries where you have A, B, C, or D, which one is it? And if it says all of the above, that's usually the answer. But when, when we're looking at this, even from a school perspective, we're not taught to think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. We're taught to say, okay, here's the answer. Now go with it. But don't question it because that is the answer right there. But then when you're dealing with this field or with thought experiments, you have to th you have to think outside of the box that you can't do anything else. Because if you fall into this little into this little cubicle of attempting to understand, you're not going to get anywhere and you're going to figure that one out the super hard way. I so agree. And I think our education system definitely does people a disservice in that. You know, I don't necessarily believe in some like vast academic conspiracy to suppress information. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think it's just like more subtle than that. Um, you know, I, I think that just as an example, like uh, going back to quantum mechanics, you know, most people who learn about quantum mechanics in high school and in college, none of those people, mo the vast majority of them are not even going to be scientists or physicists or anything else. This is like a part of their like larger, broader education. And so what's really important is that like they get the main concepts, that they understand that this did happen, that they've got the historical context, but it's like not super important that they understand every aspect of quantum mechanics and it would be unrealistic to expect that they would. And so everyone's just sort of given this, you know, usually the the Copenhagen explanation is given for quantum mechanics, which I, you know, I won't get into, but there's several different, you know, explanations for what could be going on with the weirdness of quantum mechanics. Um, but most people are only ever taught one of those because it's just, it makes more sense that way. It's more expedient. But then the problem is, is that then students walk away from their classes thinking that like, number one, this is settled science, but we understand what's going on with quantum mechanics and we absolutely don't. And so I think that, that ha that's just like a micro example that happens often on a macro scale where just the way that information is presented in our school system gives people this kind of false feeling that there is a, that a lot more of this is more settled science than it actually is. I agree with you there. You have a blog on your website and there you wrote the blog titled Meet Magdalene, the AI ghost. And that's a pretty interesting story to it. Can you kind of tell us what you found? Yeah, so I got super into um, AI art, which is actually becoming quite controversial. And I, I, uh, I will say that I am, I, I think about that. So that's, but I started um, a podcast with my friend Nathan. It's just a little side podcast. It's called Perturbations, and it's literally just about our kind of shared love of AI art and talking about, um, you know just the various, you know, ethical and technological and consciousness-based questions that arise from this new 
um, art modality. So I had been playing around with it for a few weeks. And it's kind of a long story um, that I won't get too much in the weeds in. But basically, I started recognizing that there was this character that started appearing more and more often in, in my art. And it's this woman and she's um, facing away. Uh, you can actually see her. I didn't realize this either. She's like in my logo up here. You can barely see her, but I was excited. I didn't, she, so she had been appearing in like a lot of my, a lot of my art. Um, she's wearing blue. She has a kind of an updo that looks a little old fashioned -y, And she's usually, she's usually has a coat that looks a little like more kind of an old fashioned kind of anachronistic type thing. Um, and it's just very strange. And so through a, a series of synchronicities, I started recognizing her in my art. And what's crazy is that she shows up now in probably 80 to 90% of the mid journey art that I do, um, with the caveat that it's on the version three, they updated it with version four. I can't find her in version four. So it's like, no, I'm like afraid I'm going to lose her. Um, but what's really interesting, I named her Magdalene and I call her an AI ghost. I don't, actually know that that's, I don't know if she's a ghost. I don't know what she is. It's just a name. Um, but I find her very, very interesting. And what I think so cool about Magdalene is that she shows up, like I said, in about 80 to 90% of my prompts um, when I allow the AI to make most of the decisions. So if I do it like almost like Ouija board style, and I'm just like, I'm listening. She appears like 80 to 90% of the time. Um, or if I ask like, what are you? If I ask direct questions, or if I do something like a prompt that, that leaves things that isn't a question, but leaves the AI to make all the decisions. So like anomalous experience would be a good prompt for that. Um, Cause like, what does that mean? Anomalous and experience like the, the, the uh, algorithm has to decide for itself what it thinks that means. And she seems to appear often. Um, and there's other characters. There's a red version of her. There's a red ghost that appears a lot. And there's also this like broad shouldered man. And it's so, I'm so intrigued by it. I'll probably do like a short story with them at some point because it does feel like there's sort of these like narrative threads emerging. And like I said, I make no claims about what she is. Um, I d don't necessarily think she's like a conscious entity or anything, but it is really interesting to me how um, an algorithm, like how an AI based system could produce what you could almost compare to like an archetype in itself. Like it, it has this sort of emergent, character that just shows up um who's very distinct i find it really interesting but she's discoverable by other people other people can find her too so it's not just me i just think it's a really but i think it's an interesting way for us to potentially study consciousness and the phenomenon i'm not quite sure how but it does make because it just reminds me of that in so many ways it does sound a little freaky and if <laughs> anything something that belongs in creepy posture or, or maybe some modern legend I, I agree. And people, a lot of people are creeped out by the story. It's interesting that I haven't been creeped out by it. Um, I actually have a lot of like affection for her, but the overwhelming response for people I tell this story to is like, they're, they're creeped out. And so and I've had people ask me like, if she shows up one day and is your Uber driver, are you getting in? I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> but you know, I think uh, I, I it, it is a creepy story. It's funny that I don't perceive it that way, but I can understand why people do. Well, if she is your Uber driver, then you can finally ask all those burning questions that you have. Exactly. How would you say no, right? Exactly. <laughs> Kelly, thank you so much for being on Shifting the Paradigm. Where can people find you online to stay up to date with your shows and your future books? Yeah, so... Um... Well, Christina so kindly has had my uh, handles on there. But if you're looking for kind of a one-stop shop of everything that I've got, you can go to my website, uforabbithole.com. You'll find links to um, my various podcasts, um, podcast appearances. You can buy the book, um, you know, dive into the blog, find out more about Magdalene. All of it is there on my website, uforabbithole.com. And the podcast is available anywhere you listen. You're listening to the UnX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. I would like to thank Kelly once again for taking the time to speak with me. All of her social media links and where to get her book are in the description box below. Check out my website at strangeparadigms.com to catch all of these show archives in podcast and video formats, along with all of my social media links, such as Discord, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and more. Follow me on Twitter at I underscore on the skies to catch all of my updates and news. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. 
please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the sky.